Thank you for this meeting. Welcome everybody to our 8-11-2022 City Council work session meeting. Um, and we're going to start a minute early because I'm that efficient. Um, we are going to have a public hearing and I'm going to read, <laughs> I'm going to read the rules of the public hearing. The hearing shall be presided over by the mayor. After calling the hearing to order, the mayor shall request that parcels that the parcels of property which are the subject of the zoning proposal be identified in red. Following such identification and reading, the development director's recommendations shall be presented. The mayor and city council shall cause the director's written recommendation to be marked, uh, made part of the record. Proponents of each proposed zoning decision shall then be allowed a total of 10 minutes for presentation of data, evidence, and opinion concerning the zoning decision. If all 10 minutes are not used, the proponents' remaining time shall be reserved for rebuttal. Opponents of each proposed zoning decision shall then be allowed a total of 10 minutes for presentation of data, evidence, and opinion concerning each zoning decision. The presentation times may not be reduced, but may be extended by majority vote, provided they are expanded equally for proponents and opponents. Anyone wishing to speak must come to the microphone and give their name and address to the city clerk. Do not speak unless you have the microphone and have been recognized. And um, something else that we do is uh, ask anybody that comes up to this microphone to fill out a, a name and address card that we can give to our city clerk. So we begin. Thank you. Um, we begin with a PD 2022-1021, uh, uh, which is 1758th Street, a residential front yard retaining wall. Um, staff recommendation is approval uh, of the following variance request. Um, the variance for a retaining wall visible from the public right-of-way to be constructed of wood instead of decorative uh, concrete modular block or base of stone or brick or textured cement masonry. Staff recommends following exhibits and conditions. The development shall be constructed in substantial conformity with Exhibit A by plan and pictures dated and received uh, June 3rd, 2022. The revisions required by conditions of approval is reviewed and approved by planning and development director. Um, the variance approval is given to bring the recently constructed wooden retaining wall into zoning compliance as constructed only, and the applicant shall remove at the applicant's expense any portion of the wooden retaining wall located in the public right-of-way that public works may require, and shall fill and sod any areas uh, where the wall is removed if required. So we have here, the applicant is on Eric and Amanda Morgan at 1758th Street, um, and they are bringing a newly installed replacement wooden retaining wall into zoning compliance. Uh, you can see here where the yellow line is, where the uh, wooden retaining wall is. This is also the location of the previous wall uh, that was on site. Here's the site location. So um, during construction, of this house uh, or remodel construction. Um, there was an existing wooden wall that you can see there in the February of uh, 22 picture. Uh, that wall was replaced, but no variance was given uh, for that. It is uh, okay uh, for our code to replace a wall uh, one for one, but uh, in this case, uh, there was no certainty as to whether the wall was uh, heightened. Uh, and just based on looking at the wall, we uh, staff felt that it should be brought back or brought counsel because it does appear there might be one additional uh, layer uh, to the wall and might receive an uh, increase in height. And that is it for the staff report for that. Okay, anybody wishing to speak in favor of this variance? Come on up. Do you want the card 
Board now. Should we also go with this? I apologize, I did not receive that. Oh no. Okay. Sorry for that. That's okay. Um, that's weird. Oh John, well. John, can we get that after? Yeah. Do the best you can. Okay, that works. Um, so my husband Eric and I bought our home on that 1758 Street back in 2016. The wall was originally built on the property back in 1952. Uh, Eric and I loved our first home for five years, living there with our two black labs, Cooper and Tugboat. Um, in early 2021, we began to face severe damage and deterioration of the home, just due to its old age and low quality repairs done to it over time. The retaining wall that existed between our house and our next door neighbor's house, as you can see, um, had served our needs well while we lived there, even remaining intact after a random drunk driver drove over it <laughs> in our yard two years ago, but that's a a story for another day. Um, and we had to pay for the damages to that to my car. Anyway, uh, since Eric and I love the neighborhood and knowing we needed more space for a future growing family, we made the decision back in early 2021 to tear down the old home and build a new one on our lot. When we first determined building plans and budgets with our builder, we knew the house would be a stretch financially, though worth it for the investment. So we made the decision to keep the old retaining wall and plan to reevaluate that in, in a few years. As the house construction neared completion, one of the last steps was to complete the landscaping. So I stopped by the construction site during that process and noticed one of the retaining wall levels had actually been knocked out. Um, we requested the landscaping company fix the damage that had been done, and they ended up actually replacing the retaining wall completely since it couldn't be fixed. Since the new wall built was intended to be just a replacement of the existing wall, we didn't think there would be a code compliance issue. Uh, so when we received the code violation, we asked the landscaping company for a quote to tear down the new wall and build a wall in compliance with the code. And the estimated price for the cheapest allowed option with concrete modular block it would be about $10,000. And a lot of money, especially being over budget already on our entire build. Um, and we also think that concrete modular block would look way worse than a wooden retain wall. So, of course, a stone wall would look great, but that would be insanely more expensive than $10,000 even. Uh, due to rising construction costs since we began the build of, uh, building process a year and a half ago, the cost of our new home actually ended up being $80,000 over the budget even provided to us at the start. I think we picked the worst possible time to construct, but you know, hindsight, right? Um, so we were already now struggling to afford our new home with the unexpected cost increases as is, and we just can't afford another $10,000 cost to our budget. So we asked that city council accept our variance request and allow us to keep the newly built wood retaining wall. Um, and we've received so many compliments from our neighbors already. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have a timekeeper. <laughs> I think this right now, this is not um, necessary. Anybody else we wish him to speak in favor of this various request? Please come to the microphone. No? Anybody um, wish him to speak in opposition to this various request? What I thought. So I'm okay with the time. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. What? Oh, you're right. Um, this will come up again. This is not the time for the city council to comment on this. This is just for public comment. So this will come up again later on in the meeting. All right. So stick around. And that's welcome. Okay. So the second um, item on the public hearing agenda is 
number 3551 PZ 2022 10 22 21 35 American Industrial Way. Hey, Mayor, based on the analysis of the application using the standards and criteria uh, found in the EDO, uh, staff does recommend approval of the following variance requests. Uh, variance one, or first variance request, variance from chapter four, section B, in the uh, Chamblee, uh, downtown Chamblee Town Center plan unit development pattern book to allow a ground sign between the building and the street. Okay. Also a variance from chapter four, section B, uh, to allow a ground sign to be located 34 uh, feet from the right of way instead of 50 feet and a variance uh, from the UDO to allow um, one additional sign on the building facade less than 200, uh, square, 200 feet in length. Uh, staff also recommends a withdrawal without prejudice of the following uh, variance request, which is a variance from the UDO code 260-9 to allow painted or adhered signs from the roof and membrane or accessory mechanical units. Um, staff recommends the following exhibits and conditions. Uh, exhibit A, site plan dated and received July 21st, 2022. The signage shall be in substantial conformity with Exhibit A, with the revisions uh, required by conditions of approval and review and approved by uh, planning and development director. So this is again uh, the tables and chairs building at 2135 American Industrial Way. Um, and it is the installation uh, for the installation of monument foul ground signs and wall signs. The adaptive reuse of the office building is expected to be completed this summer. Um, current variance requests are for signage only for a ground monument sign and two wall signs, as we discussed. Uh, the ground monument signs will both be four feet tall and eight feet wide, total up to 32 square feet, uh, constructed primarily of reused exterior bricks. And the applicant also proposes to install two wall signs on the east facade of the building to maximum allow one. The existing 2135 wall sign on the east facade is 36 square feet. The total square footage of both signs combined on the facade would total no more than the max maximum size allowed for a single sign, which is 200 square feet. That means that the tenant wall sign would be a maximum of 164 square feet. The applicant requests approval of those variances as mentioned above, um, as we mentioned before, uh, to allow a ground sign between the building and the street and to allow a ground sign located 34 feet uh, from the right of way instead of 50. And also um, from the UDO uh, variances uh, to allow a second wall sign. This is the building uh, site plan. You can see the location of the monument sign. The proposed monument sign is here. And the wall sign, uh, they have the 23, uh, 2135 right there on the side. Uh, it is uh, something we wanted to note that the monument sign is uh, very close to building. Um, and you can see it's 10 feet from the building, 34 feet from the right of way. Money sign renderings and the site location and comparison. Um, here you see the potential location of the other wall sign. The same facade as the existing 2135. East, south, east, and east, east. And that is all we have. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Anyone wishing to speak in favor of these variances, please come to the stand. Thank you. Uh, wow. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> good evening. My name is Randy Holmes. I'm with the applicant, Seven Oaks Company, and I'm joined here tonight by my business partner, Andrew Pearson, who is here also to help um, address any questions that may come up. And I'll fill out a sheet when I'm done. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. City Manager, for reading um, our um, variance applications as well as for your recommendation for approval. And um, I'm going to try to cut this short because I think that hopefully the presentation was somewhat self-explanatory. But these three variance requests are are solely because of the existing conditions of the property, which we've tried very hard with y'all's cooperation uh, to maintain. The two variances on the monument sign, uh, first being you're not supposed to have a sign between a building and a road, American Industrial Way curves. And so we've got kind of two front doors. And so the only where place to put that that's not between a building and a road would be on the other side of the building in between the two, the, our, our neighbor that you couldn't see it from the road. So that was reason number one. The second variance request to go from 50 feet to 34 feet is that simply if you get, if you pushed it back 50 feet, you'd be into our parking lot, which we kept that footprint, which was very important. We'd lose parking, which we need every single space that we've got. And um, hence the variance request to go from 50 down to 34. I will say, um, you may have noticed from the quick image of the sign, uh, we're gonna use reclaimed materials from the building. Um, we, when we punched windows into the building, we saved a lot of the brick. So that uh, monument sign would be very cool to be made of the brick. It's also gonna be, half the size that we're permitted to by uh, code. So we think it's gonna be a nice, nice scale. And then the final uh, variance from the UDO is relative to the two wall signs on the, the east facing side, which is kind of our loading dock sign. So today, and before we even got started with this project, the 2135 uh, logo existed. We've repainted it just to make it look fresher, but we wanted to leave it just because it's part of the original character. And we simply want the ability for marketing purposes to be allowed to put a tenant name on that sign. Highly visible. Obviously, that sign would be subject to approval of all the standards. But uh, we also agree that we would not exceed the total square footage allowed for even one sign, which is 200 square feet. We'll do both of them within the 200. So um, those are the reasons to try to maintain the, the character of the building and the footprint. Um, and. Uh, I'll reserve the rest of my time to uh, address any uh, uh, comments. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in favor of this variance request? Come on up. Anyone wishing to speak against? No? Okay. Good. That ends the um, public hearing portion. Microphone. That ends the public hearing portion of this meeting. So now we're going to start our regular, I'm calling our regular meeting to order. Um, so on to announcements and presentations. We have our 2021 audit results presentations. <laughs> Okay, good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. And as I said, I'm going to present the results of the December 31st, 2021 audit. Who are you? Who do you work for? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that was coming up. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Josh Carroll, and I work for Mullen and Jenkins. Um, we do this the city's external audit. We've done it for a number of years, and I'm a director with the firm and I kind of cover over the city's uh, overall audit. Um, I was gonna, this is our agenda. I was going to go over Mullen and Jenkins, the engagement team, um, the results of the audit. Got some comments and some recommendations and some financial trends and then questions at the end. But if anybody has any questions as I'm going, you can feel free to stop me. Um, this is a slide about the firm. Um, we do tons of governments, county cities, development authorities, state agencies. Um, we, it's about 30% of the firm's overall practice. Um, everyone that was assigned to your audit on this slide does nothing but government audits. Um, we invest fully in governments. Spend 100% of my year doing it. I don't do any tax work. Um, so we bring a lot of knowledge and experience to the government industry. And uh, Doug Moses was the partner. Um, he couldn't be here tonight, but he was ultimately responsible for the audit this year. Um, the statements are the responsibility of the city's management. Um, our objective as your external auditors to express an opinion. We followed all the generally accepted auditing standards, government auditing standards, and we ultimately issued an unmodified opinion, or a clean opinion, which is what you would hope to get. And so as far as we're concerned, based on our testing, the city's financial statements are materially correct. Um, this slide, you know, 
If I was on council, I want to know if we have any unusual accounting policies or aggressive estimates. And we evaluate those, and if you don't, they're pretty standard. They're disclosed in the notes to the financial report. Um, the big ones are your pension. Um, there's a lot of actuarial assumptions and estimates in there. And, you know, you use GMA, a lot of cities use that, so they're pretty standard and they're not overly aggressive. So there's really nothing significant there that would influence your statements one way or the other. Um, here we have a good list of the management. Um, everybody gives us everything we ask for. We'll give pretty much all the departments and nothing seems hidden or covered up. Um, we did have a few audit adjustments. They were really small. They didn't make it to a finding or a management comment. They didn't seem significant enough to report to the council. So it was overall a really clean audit. And that's you know, not the norm, for sure. Um, here we are independent. Um, we don't do anything other than the external audit. We don't do any bookkeeping or any other kind of services that we get paid for that can influence our opinion as your external auditor. Um, and then getting into the trends, this is these are all kind of five years. This is our net position, and it's kind of trended up over the years. The last five years, most of that is capital in nature. It's, you know, building like these nice facilities. Those become assets. Or we used our cash to build up our on the net position, government wide. Um, fund balance, kind of similar. The big ones, the general fund, it's kind of crept up over the last few years. You know, the last couple of years, sales taxes and property taxes have been pretty strong. Like the economy's come out of COVID, so we've kind of built that back up. And the blue line is all the other governmental funds, and most of the big jumps there are the URA fund issuing bonds um, to, you know, fill our objectives in those redevelopment areas. Um, so that's kind of the big jumps in the blue boxes. Um, and they issue the bonds and get a bunch of cash and we ultimately spend it. And it will roll up into the that position on the previous slide as we spend those bonds. Um, this slide is probably the most important slide. It shows our fund balance of the general fund is the percentage of our overall annual expenses. And we're pretty much at 100%, which is really strong. The, the GFOA is kind of the standard setting body for governments, and they recommend two to three months at a minimum. That's 16 to 25%. So we're we're well above that. We get a healthy fund balance, uh, you know, in our general fund, which is a good thing. And we didn't have any findings. We did have a few uh, management comments. We look at fee card transactions, and we tested 25, 17 of them. We didn't see an approval. Um, not to say the approval didn't happen, it just wasn't visible to us. There was no trail of it. So we made a recommendation that we kind of make sure all those get approved. And I think since those transactions occurred, a policy's been in place. And so I'm sure I think the finance has kind of already addressed this. Um, so I don't think we'll have that going forward. And we did notice some old outstanding checks here. Um, the state of Georgia says if you got a check that's over five years, you should have sheeted to the state. Um, so I kind of want you to stay on top of those and review our outstanding checks. And when they do get to over five years, we should try to either find an individual so they can get the money or we should just turn it over to the state and let them handle it. So nothing huge. Um, we do have a new gas be coming up 91. Um, the downtown development authority has conduit debt. It's, they've issued debt for a developer. Basically, it's not our debt, we're not responsible for it, but we disclose it in the statements and we really don't know how much is outstanding? I mean, they issued the bonds and then ultimately they built the facility and they start paying them down. And this Gatsby is going to require us to disclose how much is outstanding. That will be effective for your December 31st, 2022 audit. So I just want you to kind of get started on contacting whoever can get us that information. I don't think it's going to be difficult to obtain, but we just didn't invest the time in the audit this year because it wasn't necessary. But we will need that going forward. And the last one we do continue to highlight cybersecurity in the IT world. It's always front page news. Just want to make sure we remind the council that it's ever changing. We need to keep our IT group in training and train our employees for phishing and all these other wild cyber attacks that happen. It's like I've had clients that are extremely large down to cities with, you know, 800 residents get taxed. So no one is too big or too small. Um, just want to keep highlighting that. And Gatsby's always busy. Then next year we're going to have to implement Gatsby 87. It deals with leases 
and it kind of redefines what a lease is. It's not just going out and leasing a copier or a police vehicle. It's kind of any fixed monthly payment that's more than a year. So we need to look at any types of contracts we have for that. The big ones I think about are rent and just any monthly payment that we have a contract for. We're going to have to book those. We're going to throw an asset up, asset up on the books and allow do it. It's not going to be a huge impact for the city. And we can be on both sides. We could have someone paying us to use some space we have. So we could have a lease less or on less lease side of that. So that's the big thing coming up. Um, it's going to impact the, the overall financial report in the next two years. And we do have a government advisory service group that I believe we've talked about before. And they do a lot of heat projects. They deal with budgeting, performance measures, strategy. Um, and they kind of deal with like operational efficiencies. How is our each individual department functioning? Are they utilizing the resources in a good way? What could we do better? Um, it's, they do a lot of neat projects. If it's anything the city ever wants to know more about, I can kind of connect you with the partner that heads that up. Um, and, and we do continue to provide free CPE to all of our clients. Um, anyone in the city is welcome to attend those. We give 28 hours of free CPE annually um, to free those costs to our clients. And that's it. If anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. We really enjoy working with the city. Are we your favorite? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> thank you. Very good. Great job, as always. Yeah, thank you. Is our man with master finance had any questions on this? <laughs> yeah, I do actually. Uh, but yes, yeah, for the city manager, it's not enough for you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the purchase card transactions, approval, and outstanding uh, checks, uh, you said that this may brought your attention earlier, has, and what have you done? In, Sure that since then. So on the P cards, uh, we have uh, changed our system and Julie could probably speak a little bit more to that. I will say that our when we switched over to our new bank and started using the uh, card with that, uh, they have a digital system that we use. In that, I know I personally was I was taking my receipts and I was attaching that to my uh, item in the card. Uh, so that they were attached, but I wasn't then putting it in an envelope, a digital envelope for someone to look at. And so that was uh, part of that issue. And so we've made sure that those digital envelopes are, are now part of the process. I hope I said that right. Um, that was my simplistic remembering. remembering so. We've also uh, did an, an internal audit and reviewed our key cards um, over the last six months and um, revamped our key card policy. Um, and so we have some new rules and regulations that we rolled out to the department heads. So we did that um, effective April 1st. Thank you. Moving right along. Um, Item number two under announcements and presentations. Your microphone on. Um, we have a code enforcement update. Thank you, Mayor. We've asked the code enforcement to come tonight to provide an update on their services <laughs> going and going forward. Good afternoon, yep. Mayor Council. How are you doing today? Good afternoon, um, Mayor and Council. It's a pleasure. I am the code enforcement supervisor, um, William Robbins. It's nice to meet you guys all in person at the same time. Thank you. Um, click, click, okay. <laughs> so to make up your code enforcement team, like I said, I am the supervisor. I've been a city employee for nine years with the police department and divided it with um, planning and development. I was also with the Cal Police Department for four years. Officer um, Renato Centron has been in the city for six months, and he also was a part of the DeKalb Police for seven years. Officer Nelson, Nel Officer Ramon Nelson has been with the city of Shambly for three years, serving with the city of Shambly. And right now we have a vacant position for the code enforcement coordinator. So what is code enforcement? We all know that it is the process of preventing and inspecting, mitigating nuisance on public and private premises, health, safety, and general welfare. 
Um, do not regulate aesthetics, taste, civil disputes, HOA violations, or noise. Normally, the noise violations, the police department handles that. But if it's after hours um, construction, then code enforcement does be get involved with it. Um, we, are, we do have the relationship with the community members and working with the upkeep of the property. Often, we are the face of the city community, directly contact with the staff, and often it becomes one connecting them to other departments. So the process and scope. We all know that code enforcement, it, we enforce it, the city codes, property maintenance, illegal signs, lighting, vehicles, um, illegal businesses, land use, apartment suites program, multifamily annual interior building inspections program, proactive enforcement, delinquent optics, and voluntary compliance. Our approach is compliant based with door hangers, warning letters, conversations, daily patrol, notices non-compliance, violation of code, and education with the residential gap. This year we will have our first residential guide to the public and it's going to actually be on the Shelby website. So it's kind of a breakdown of the normal codes that code enforcement comes in contact with. Um, I kind of created a language for the public and to be able to understand other than our um, muni code sections. So my favorite part is the code enforcement by numbers. If you guys look at it, we did a breakdown of 2021 and 2022. Um, the total cases monthly is was in 2021 was 237. It jumped for 2022 to 319. Um, total violations went up from 223 to 268. And citations monthly went from 2021, um, 11 citations and 13, 2022. Total apartment suites. We normally do apartment suites once a month. Um, and we just now started the new process of all the commercial suites. So we've combined those two, and I'll show you later the breakdown of the apartment um, suites. So if you look at 2021, the monthly average, and um, 2022 average to May 31st, you see the signs um, went from 70 to 74. Um, that's 22% equally. Um, permits 87 in 2021 and now to 48. Um, that's going to be 14 percent lower than the 29 percent that we had last year. Junk and storage has went up 13 percent from 2021 and 32 percent, 9 percent um, in 2022. Vehicles and parking 26 to 47.8. So it went from 9 percent to 14 percent. Vegetation and grass, this is one of the big ones, especially in the summertime, um, they, they went up as well. It went from 73 to 101 for the year of 2022. Went from 23% to 29%. All other violations are included, which went from 10% to 12%. Um, we do have the same number of officers, two officers and a supervisor. Um, the increased average went from 87 per month. Um, our 2021 Optex renewal visits, that was crazy just because of some fact. Um, code enforcement had not touched the uh, optics in a few years. Um, I came on back in September of 2020 and I saw the big impact that no businesses was, was being touched. So it went from 1,632 businesses that we had to go and check. Um, out of those 1,600, we ended up having 580 cases because we had a lot of business that moved out the city. Um, again, the total 22, the 2022 apartment sweeps, 450 um, notices of violations altogether. So this, the trend is a significant increase in case related to junk, debris, vehicles, and vegetation and grass. Um, proactive um, citations. These have actually went up. Um, just because these are six months totals. Um, if you see from 2019 all the way from 2020, code enforcement really didn't write too many citations in 2019. and went from nine and then 2022, 38, 2021, 136. And that number as 118 has changed. It's at 145 right now. 
proactive building permits. 2019, I mean, 2019 went from four. Um, 2020, 2020, 124. 2021, 264, and 2022, within six months, we're at 140 right now. And those are proactive building permits where code enforcement proactively rides around the city and catch contractors doing work without permits. And as we know, that is a safety issue when you're catching an unlicensed contractor that's coming inside the city doing that work. Um, proactive occupational tax. Like I said, um, none was touched. 2019, there was zero. Um, 2021 and 2022, I mean, 2021, 580. That number has decreased now. We're at 516 now. And we touched every single business. We actually just finished that tweet and um, touched every business in the city. And the way that we handle that is, um, notices of violations is issued to those businesses. That and that code enforcement case is created. It's never closed until that business has come current with their business license slash occupational tax. Um, the breakdown of our apartment sweeps, uh, Villas de Los Colonas for apartments had a total of 208 violations. Dresden Villas apartments, 30 violations, which they are very small. They only had two buildings in that apartment complex. Bloom at Dresden, this is one of the big ones, 162 violations that had not been touched in several years. We found a lot of fire code violations. I ended up having to contact the fire, um, the care fire marshal. New um, Peachtree Apartments was 50, and then our reporting of multifamily annual reporting for the two complexes that we have in the city right now. Um, we only have seven right now of apartments that we're waiting on to submit their multifamily code compliance certificates. I hope I'm not taking too long. So the major cases for code enforcement, of course, the burn building across from Dresden Park. Um, that had been sitting out there for a long time, so we ended up having to contact that property owner so we need to get this out of here in the south. Um, done with the exchange apartments, if you look over to your right corner, top corner, those were the decks that was eroded and very dangerous. Um, we ended up making them replace every deck inside of that apartment complex, and that is the after photo of that um, apartment complex. Our biggest case was Buford Lodge, and it's been sitting there for a while. I had cases over there as a police officer and a detective, and to tell you to to, I collected, once I came on, I collected over a year and a half of evidence because I knew that this case was going to court. And um, Buford Lodge had high power attorneys and they were going to fight this because they did not want to get rid of it. So we collected enough um, evidence to, you know, have the judge to favor us in that decision. Our, our new demand for code enforcement is our commercial building sweeps, our vacant property register, uh, registry, which is proposed, which you guys are going to be um, looking at that later. Um, increase delinquent opt tax cases, increase engagement with businesses, lighted property ordinance, coffee and code slash um, neighborhood engagement, and again, the residence guide. Um, our new housing unit has grown over 900 plus, our new city commercial has grown 300,000 300, square footage in the past three years. This is one of the commercial suites we just did. If you look at it, this is gonna be a commercial business off of Shelby Dunway Road. Um, this property has been a nuisance for a very long time, ever since I um, first came over in 2013 as a, a police officer. Um, and there was a lot of high crime area um, violations in that area. Um, if you can see the elevator didn't work, um, there is multiple damage to the exterior of the building, um, some illicit discharges, um, openings inside of the buildings, painting, graffiti, all of that. I just had a meeting with the new owner of that property, and his plan is to put over a million dollars of repairs into that building since doing that um, commercial suite. So the scope, again, is um, enforcement of the city codes, property maintenance, illegal signs, illegal businesses, 
apartment suites, multifamily, annual interior building inspections, um, proactive enforcement, the delinquent optax, and Saturday patrol. My guys who come in on Saturday um, and look for any type of violations. A lot of times it's the signs that's, because that's when the sign companies are coming inside the city and placing these signs in the right away. Our two officers cover the entire city, north and the south zone. So they're broken up between Savoy all the way down to Shelby Dunwoody. That would be the north side and from Shelby, well, Buford Highway. And from Buford Highway down to Claremont Road in 85, that'd be our south side. Again, I am your supervisor of code enforcement. Um, and this is where our, um, the community can make a complaint through our city source app and our My Shelby app. I am the supervisor, William Robbins. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple of questions. I bet you there's going to be more from uh, just from these guys too. So your resident guide is going to be just posted on the city website? Well, we're in talks right now. Um, I would love for a pamphlet, but that's going to cost a lot of yeah. paper, paperwork. Yeah. I was thinking if it was an attachment to the um, website, anybody can go and hit that attachment and, and be able to print that, that attachment out from their homes. Or their Maybe businesses. we could announce that that exists in the signal so that you know people can know to look. Um, that's great. Now, we've gone through several iterations of our code enforcement, um, enforcement. and um, this sounds like a really effective way to do it. It sounds like you, um, the three of you right now, are um, more engaged with our citizens, which I think is absolutely fantastic because that's really necessary. Um, do, do we have, uh, what is our mechanism now for complaints, code enforcement complaints, complaints rather. Do we have a one of those buttons? As far as what? <laughs> as far as for anybody to call in the code enforcement Correct. Complaint? They can either call in, they can email, they can go into the City Source app or the My Shamley app. And, okay. And those once those complaints have come in, cases are created, they're dispatched to offices and the officers respond to those locations. And of course they're anonymous. Some of them, um, and, and they have an option of being anonymous, okay. and, I, and that's one of the first questions we ask. Do you want to remain, remain anonymous? Those who want to put their names out there, we go ahead and place their names and their phone numbers in that report. And then they get secret service protection. Of course. <laughs> and, I will, I will and so, do every does every person that makes a complaint get a call back? They, yes, okay. I'm glad you asked Thank that you. yesterday. Okay. And you. not only do they get a call back, they are actually called back after the case has been closed to okay. let that complainant know what has come about with that case. Okay. I was just going to mention that we are moving to a new website, and that, that website will have uh, an integrated uh, you know, uh, new, uh, complaint uh, mechanisms uh, that we talked about before. So. As we transition to that new website, you'll have a place where you can register that complaint and it'll go into our new software. Um, go, I think it's called go Pilot. Pilot. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll be distributed with that from the website as well. Okay, that sounds very promising. Anybody else? No, I, I mean, I just noticed that you did some of the 2022 stuff you did as an average based on the first set of months, but I think there's probably some things like grass or whatever that's where the highest months are included in the average, whereas like in November, December, the average may be much lower. So it may drag some of those average calls of 2022 down at the year end. Correct. Yes. So that's, that makes any sense. That's, uh, that was the only thing I noted. So that was just everything. Some things would do that, some things would, who knows. Right. There's some cyclical stuff. And, and before ending this, I do want to say that um, I have a very good team. Um, they're very proactive. I'm very big on proactive, coming from the police department with my old boss back there, Chief. Um, <laughs> but 
that's one thing when I came over, I wanted to engage more with the public and be more proactive. So everything so far since 2020 of me coming on um, and, and creating a great team, you get the results that you get now. And what vehicles do y'all have there? Um, we have the RAV4s. RAV, the Toyota RAV4s. Oh, yeah. So that was the big, my big thing when I first got on council was when we had uniformed police officers and squad cars showing up. And I can't tell you how many times my phone would ring like, what's going on over at Miss Barry's house? What's, or Miss Barry would call like, I woke up and there's police sitting up. So I much prefer this professional, not that the police aren't professional, but it's a different look. It's a different look and feel. It's still professional, but it's still, uh, just it's less intimidating, I guess. Right. Yes. Yeah, so right. that's what is it? And, and and I don't think there was ever any kind of issue with the police. It's just it's just that whole, you know, a lot of people get really nervous no, the first time they see a police officer show up. There was one or two. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But then I I think we finally got to the kind of look and feel and operation that I tried been trying for a while to get. I think you're right. It took a little bit, but yeah. hey, we tried. We did it. Yeah. I do want to say William has done a great job with the code enforcement team and uh, you know there was an article about Patriot Swelling in the Atlanta Journal of Constitution. Um, I think they did reach out to us, they did talk to right. him about that. Um, I know we have done a really good job of making sure uh, that the apartments uh, in the city are maintained uh, as we showed you with some of those uh, pictures uh, and we are very effective with those apartments. Just had an apartment fire recently, the last several months, and it's important to correct it and try to do what we can to keep that. And as I was speaking about the Loom's apartments, you know, um, we had fire marshal, our code enforcement had not been over to do it to get a sweep. So we had a lot of fire codes over there, um, and it, it looked real bad. So mm -hmm. they're in progress right now, just um, repairing and fixing everything over there. And also our, our multi-family suite, like I said, this year is our most profitable year for that interior because a lot of times it was hard for code enforcement or any government official to get inside of somebody's home. So now we're able to enforce our multi-family inspections. Out of the four, 43 apartments that we have in the city, right now we only have seven apartments that we're waiting on to submit their multi-family inspections. So that's when a qualified um, contractor goes in and do that inspections to make sure that that the interior of that apartment is done up to code. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say thank you because I'm a big believer in the broken windows philosophy and what you do makes sure that our city is safe and doesn't get run down. So thank you for that. Um, two of the big things I just want to bring up that I hear the most times are treatment. So we have, I, I know we probably don't get a lot of people on to actually pull permits on the treatment. But what is the best way to get in contact with you? Because they do quick work and then they're gone. What's the best way to contact the co president and to get you get it out quickly to inspect? It's going to be um, to have an expedited case, give me a call. Um, anybody listening to the public, um, they can reach me at 470 542 7444. That's 470 542 7444. <laughs> And then secondarily, uh, I, I saw there's a trend that there's much more violation this year over the previous year. What do you attribute to that? The growth. We, like I said, the square footage, um, the people, we got more people moving into the city. We got more residential areas and more commercial. So, of course, when you have that, you're going to get a growth of violations. And they're going to continue to rise because Shamley is a growing city. That's not the answer I was looking for. I thought our code first minute did a great job. So. <laughs> <laughs> you. But I think it's a combination. You've broken that down as a percentage as well. Yes. And and so that's that's really probably more important than just the, the sheer numbers because the percentages are more representative of our growth. Right. Yes, um, great job. Thank great you. job. And he shows in 2019, which I guess is before you were in this role. Yes, I came in. 2019 was very low, and then 2020, we all know what was going on in 2022. So I would expect, I don't know, something. Uh, it was on the news, I think. Uh, the 21, you know, is when it started swinging up. So we're, we're done with the pandemic, and we're kind of like in your full, your pro 
program is starting to get in its full stride. When I first came, when I told Tom, the city manager, I said, look, this is not going to be a year. It's going to take a couple of years to get the city sure, back to where it was. I'm surprised my phone hasn't rang more because, you know, that's what a lot of people say. Well, I haven't ever gotten a phone oh, violation God. since I've been here for 20 years. And then all of a sudden, I got some guy showing up. So sometimes that happens, but sometimes it just, that's the way that it is. You know? But right. it wasn't packing a gun. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest complaint I ever got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Moving right along, it's kind of like this is a very exciting topic, isn't it? Um, we have staff action items. We have under the city clerk approval of minutes for the city council public hearing work session July 14, 2022, held at 6 o'clock. Anybody want to make any? Changes. Okay. Minutes. Really Approval of the minutes. Um, City Council regular meeting July 19, 2022. Approval of the minutes. Anybody want to make any changes there? Oh, we only have two meetings that we have to look at on this particular docket. Under the city manager, um, number one, we have the Marta Station mural. <laughs> Uh, this design may look a little familiar to folks in the community and to members of our city council. It was created by artist Lauren Stromberg. She originally submitted her work for consideration as a mural on this building that we're in this evening. She was not selected. She was one of the four finalists, but was not selected for this site. And over the last several months, we've continued to consider her concept um, and consider where an appropriate place in the community may be. Public Arts Commission has discussed her design, and we've also discussed for several months partnering with MARTA for installation of a mural at the uh, station facing Peachtree Road. So recently, we've been in conversation with those partners at MARTA, and we've reached an agreement on cost sharing so that the City of Chambly and MARTA can partner to add new public art in our downtown. So the proposed mural size is roughly 75 by 15 feet just over a thousand square feet of new public art that we brought to our downtown. Total cost of installation for that area is $34,000, and MARTA is open to a 75-25 cost share. That totals $25,500 from the Public Arts Commission budget, which is included in the budget that was approved for this fiscal year. MARTA's cost is $8,500. They'll also provide pressure washing to prepare the site, a lift during installation, which is not an insignificant cost, as well as the final sealant to preserve the mural. So this is a concept that Lauren has updated for that space. You can kind of see roughly from the image at the top, the placement. We did do a site walkthrough a couple of weeks ago with the Marta Artbound team, as well as the artists. We may adjust this a little bit just to ensure that we're filling as much space as possible and adapting the design. But on the agenda for consideration at the uh, meeting, we have an agreement for our terms with MARTA as well as an agreement with the artist to move forward. The anticipated timeline following council action would be installation in September based on the artist's availability. And she anticipates being completed by early October, which means it would be in place before the first of the Personally, I think it's beautiful. Let me ask you something. So this is on where the buses go through on uh, Peachtree Road side. What is the surface of that? Is that that extruded concrete kind of tongue looking stuff? It is. We uh, When we did the site visit, we realized there's a lot of uniqueness there, uh, including some pillars with some different texture. But the majority of the project will be installed on smooth concrete okay. walls. Yeah. There are also some tiling within that. So that's you know, this is a full rectangular block. We talked about potentially implementing some of those elements. The artist actually had some ideas about potentially painting on some columns and being able to extend it a little bit further into that entry plaza. If you're um, coming into the station that way, there's a big plaza from the parking area and an entryway as you walk down that breezeway. So we've talked about incorporating some of those elements to make it even more of a large piece. I have no other questions. I think it's beautiful. Um, from where I sit. Anybody else? No? Nope. All right, moving right along. Thank you, Marcy. Um, number two under city manager, Shallowford Road Scoping Study. Thank you, Mayor. We have uh, with us today the consultant who is, will be presenting this. Um, the last
last year we did have um, last year we did uh, have the request of the uh, city of Doraville provide half of the match for a project to look at um, Chelmsford uh, corridor uh, and uh, look at improvements to that. Hi, I'm Stephen Hopper. I'm with uh, Stan Tech Consulting. Um, you guys might be uh, familiar with my colleague, Joel Mann, who did the um, mobility study for Shambly as well. Uh, we've been partnering, partnering a lot with both Doraville, Shambly, and the CID um, on a number of projects and making sure that those all work together. On the Shelford scoping study, uh, this project is obviously important both um, to the city of Doraville as well as you guys. Um, I don't have a clear map with me, but this project goes from Shambly Dunwoody on Shallowford Road all the way up to New Peachtree Road towards the new Martyr Station where Doraville's installing their new streetscape uh, piece right in front of that Martyr Station. That uh, everything to the west, for the most part, west and north on Shallowford Road is within the uh, city of Shambly limits, and everything to the east. South is really Doraville. It's, it's until you get up into uh, New Peachtree Road, Doraville, United Elementary Schools, obviously right there in that corner. Um, the specifics about the different fundings and the partnerships, um, I think Naomi Seidemach with the city of Doraville, um, she's not here tonight, but you follow up with her. We have a full package of both the vision document and the draft GDOT concept report that we did. Uh, which is more directed towards the state and funding potential. Uh, but Naomi was uh, very clear that she was hoping that we could share this with you all to know uh, where the project stood, what we're looking at, and uh, kind of how they're going to be progressing. So we, there were two products out of this. One was the vision report, which is more of an uh, outward-facing document that you all can use to kind of market and let people know what the project is going to be. And then the second document is the draft GIOC concept report, uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, engineering elements that the state and GDOT are more interested in. And just jump right into it. We just we followed our uh, standard design practice. We we jumped into data gathering and analysis. Really, what does this corridor want to be oh, for both cities? Uh, there's a lot. Uh, it leads right into Doraville, uh, Buford Highway is not necessarily the uh, front road they want uh, as, as far as for pedestrians and, and safe vehicular uh, relationships. So Shallowford Road really becomes that. It also becomes, this area becomes a connection to their MARTA station, the elementary school, commercial and residential for them and as you, you all as well. And New Peachtree Road obviously leads right back up to uh, the MARTA station that we're just talking about. Uh, so we there's some of the issues that we found during our data collection. Data collection was just uh, looking at accessibility and what people experience right now. Um, most of those scenarios there you see are unfavorable. Uh, the elementary school did put in a mid block crossing that was pretty well done. It makes a safe crossing for the students. Some of those apartment complexes. Accessibility is an issue. You can see this cow pass beyond that utility pole. Um, wheelchairs and um, other limitations um, are not really accounted for in, in the current situation. We also wanted to look at the mobility, who uses the corridor, how do they use the corridor, so we looked at traffic counts, pedestrian counts, uh, we, we had bus ridership counts, there's four stops along the corridor, uh, plus obviously the, the train station itself. And then we really wanted to figure out how pedestrians are accessing this. And so this was this is a walk map. Um, a lot of these details you, you are really more spelled out in the documents that you all have, uh, in the vision document and in the uh, GDOT concept report, if, if you um, want to get a little bit more information about some of these. And then we also looked at some of the analytics. And that was actually really looking, uh, diving hard into those, some of those traffic counts, what works, some of the crash data, the map to the right, uh, just pure visually, you can kind of tell up near North Peak, uh, New Peach Street up at the top of the screen um, has a lot of wrecks down near Buford. There's a lot of wrecks. And then the wrecks in between were uh, people pulling out uh, because the speeds are pretty high on Shallowford Road. 
and people pulling out and getting rear-ended. Buford Highway is obviously kind of the elephant in the room on this project. Um, that is a state route, y'all are more than aware, and um, massive improvements to Buford Highway really require a lot of state interaction. We tried to evaluate what opportunities there were without ma making major um, changes at the state level where the state would push back. Then we uh, dove into what the concept would be and uh, addressing some of those areas of concerns. And really, the pedestrian was the main um, target for this project, but we wanted to make sure that vehicles and uh, traffic along the corridor would remain the same level of service especially with the MMIP uh, project coming off 285, it is, still does, um, coming off um, in, right there at New Peach Street and where that traffic would go and how that would operate with cut-throughs both into Doraville as well as um, out New Peach Street for Chamblee. Uh, so we looked at a couple different options in different areas. You can see that there at New Peach Street on the bottom of the screen, we evaluated uh, what a roundabout would look like, what those extents of uh, impacts would be uh, down at uh, Shambly Dunwood we kind of looked at reorienting that road with Shalliford at South of Buford what that would do so we're starting to conceptualize is this is this going to work so we want to test this out and from that we de we defined a couple character areas along the corridor that were key elements of areas that we wanted to further test and make sure that those areas um, if, if some of the improvements worked in those areas, we could apply them elsewhere along the corridor. Uh, Buford Highway uh, is that obviously a, a big one there, uh, right around Asian Square and Elementary School, and then obviously New, New Peach Street with the way that that current uh, traffic signal works. We then kind of really started to define some of the concepts. And when we get into this, now we're actually testing. Um, these are the pretty pictures, obviously, but behind the scenes, our engineers and planners and traffic engineers are kind of testing the data and making sure that if we close off these roads or if we um, uh, change a, a turn signal or, or change the timing of the signals, that that's all gonna work together and then we're not causing a bigger problem than what we started with. Again, some of the pr proposed improvements uh, developed a little bit further. And then an element that was very important to us is, is that a lot of times we find that we get all the way to the end of the project and the public hasn't even heard about it. Um, GDOT does require a PIOH meeting. Those are very sparsely attended and a lot of times it's only the folks that are like the most concerned. Uh, one thing that we like to do is really kind of get out into the public. So we went to the uh, Doorbell Christmas tree lighting. We got a lot of response there. We just kind of catch people off guard a little bit. Uh, get some real comments um, without somebody feeling like they had to go like on a Tuesday night and get dressed up for a formal meeting. So we got um, a lot of really good comments from locals that use the corridor um, from kind of North Doorville all the way down into Shambly that were attending that event. And then we did hold a um, PIOH style meeting. The, this project is not within the purview of GDOT yet, so this did not um, uh, warrant a, a true PIOH meeting, but we did follow those general guidelines. Uh, you can see those of you that know Joel Mann kind of there on the right, he was, he's a big part of this as well, working with uh, Mayor Geierman, he's in those pictures as well, uh, from Doraville. When we held that meeting at CPACS, I'm gonna get it wrong, uh, the Pan Center for Pan Asian, uh, oh, yes. and, and it's right on the Shallowford Corridor, so we got some, uh, good feedback from uh, some of the uh, patrons of that center as well as um, some of the uh, local residents. <laughs> then uh, finally, just developing the concept uh, to get it really kind of polished off where there's some of the opportunities, um, public parks, kind of some of what, what kind of elements can be applied to it to kind of create that gateway feel and uh, create the character of the area and get people excited about what's going to be going on. Then finally, uh, moving into that GI concept report, I'm sure you guys have seen these. Um, they're fairly boring documents, very uh, not as exciting as what I was just showing you. But we did go ahead and provide a draft uh, version of this. And what that does is that when you go to request funding, that ensures 
that when she and ARC see these documents that okay this has already been gone through uh, the it could be something as small as like the radius of a, a, a curve cut all um, up to like speed limits or certain design criteria that we've already thought through. Now, GDOT will uh, have a different phase for this and they will make sure that all of this checks off with them. But when they see this kind of document completed, they know that we thought this through. We did interact with GDOT as well, um, let them know this project was coming. They did provide Naomi a, a letter of support that she uh, provided to ARC uh, with the request for funding. And then again, what you see in a pretty standard GDOT concept before you start getting into some very technical cross sections and cost estimates. And then um, finally, like very detailed schematics that really have a lot of things figured out that again, the state and ARC would wanna see and make sure that you thought these things through and that the project is eligible uh, for not just funding, but it's that the uh, project will move on without major snags. Um, it's my understanding that Naomi wants to make you at Naomi and the city wanted to make sure that you all were aware of the project, where we were. We're wrapping this up. This is complete. Um, they are applying for funding for this. Um, but you guys are a big partner in this. This is the corridor is in, in your purview. And uh, we're excited about the uh, potential for the corridor. I'm open for any, if you have any questions or comments, I will say though, again, if you want a lot of more detailed information, um, that the, those documents that we provided have a lot more of that meat to it. Thank you very much. Um, I think this is really good stuff. I think it's high time that Belford Road got its uh, got some attention paid on it. Anybody have yeah. any general yeah. questions? question about uh, the timeline? What are you guys looking at in the future? I think anything uh, regarding that document. Okay. Um, with the application that went into ARC. I believe that that LCI grant money should be announced this year. In the past, those announcements have been delayed. Um, but if it were announced this year, uh, the uh, proposal for engineering services could go out as soon as the end of this year or early into next year. That would enter GDOT's purview. Most projects that enter that, some of you may know, is probably about three years out uh, before shovel goes into the ground. Uh, so you're probably looking at about three to three and a half years uh, before you've seen the equipment out there on Shallow Road. Just a quick follow-up question on that. As well, is it from a, from a financial standpoint, what are you guys all parking on this right now? There was a number. I, I will answer your question, um, but there were a number of factors with this, and we were trying to limit the amount of right-of-way um, impacts. So that's where we had our largest vary. Um, varying values right now including right away we're somewhere around three million dollars the as we get further into the engineering process if we can um, reduce that those right away impacts even more um, there is a potential for that number to be reduced if um, if something comes up where a property owner um, or there was a situation um, where the project and had something that needed to be mitigated, that, that cost could potentially go up. So I want to be careful how I answer that. And I would just like to clarify, um, you said that the application was going in, has it already been completed? I, I believe she has already submitted that to ARC. Okay. This is the application for engineering, correct? For the, yes. For, for grant. And I'm sorry, the application for engineering, there would then be another application for construction. construction. Right. And then I was trying to follow along and trying to keep the tally in my head, but and I don't want to be nitpicky, but I'm just curious how much of this is actually in Chambly and the big projects anyway versus how many it looked like a lot of the big intersection improvements were in Doraville completely. Is that I mean or are they, they are they, I mean, because some I mean I just don't know how we're what it's paying for, who's paying, are we paying seventy five, you know, we don't know yet because we don't know how much it costs, but you know, just, maybe that's just a question for a later day. Remember last month when we were told that Doraville mm -hmm. said that Shout Shallowford was eligible? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how the price breaks out by city or how that. Um, 
it's to be determined uh, when our site plan uh, lays out. I do know, you know, as you mentioned, that large roundabout is looks to be completely in Doraville, so I'm not exactly sure how the rest of it plays out. Any other answer? I think if I can give a rough estimate, I would say just the looking at the land and the properties, it would probably be about 40% Shambly because it does kind of wrap around on the north end of the project right. where that concept for the roundabout, and to be clear, uh, we found that the roundabout is probably going to be too costly. So we teed up the intersection and got rid of the wild kind of free flow triangular intersection that exists there today. Um, so that would be a T intersection and we would just uh, move the signal. And so it wouldn't be the full cost of a roundabout. Um, but once you get up into that area where the roundabout is, that is, Doraville, but then as you travel south and west. And I'm not trying to nitpick it. I'm just, just kind of curious in general right now. Obviously, we're a long way mm -hmm. from knowing how much it's going to cost. And how to it. So, is this something that will be partly funded by Doraville, partly funded by Shambly, and partly funded by DDOT? I will add that uh, I believe on this study, I don't know the numbers, um, but yeah. I believe the CID was a partner as well. Uh -huh in this um, there's different ways to do this you but for the most part usually uh, local municipalities will apply for um, uh, some assistance with the engineering and that's the 80 20 split but again i'm sure you guys are used to and construction as well would probably be another 80 20 split but that 20 split uh, can be kind of how however you guys divvy it up and i, I don't know right. what those percentages would be between you all and doorville my only other question was if, and this is just a little, probably a little bit more of an aside, you know, the assembly site, yes, now let me see, um, have, has in the past um, proposed a flyover or, or a tunnel under, et cetera, et cetera. Does it take this into account in any way, shape, or form? It, it, it may never happen. We know that. I want to be careful. Um, my colleague that I mentioned earlier, Joel Mann, he, I, me and him have both, uh, we've communicated with some engineers about the possibility of that and what options exist there. I think options still do exist there and it does take into account what is occurring with this project. Yeah. I think that's probably all I can. All right. I, I would add to that, that the, I, I know that I've had some discussions with the CID director and that they are very interested in Pursuing. They, they did not receive a grant as they had hoped, uh, but they were still interested in pursuing engineering uh, or, I'm sorry, scoping out uh, potential uh, locations and feasibility for crossing uh, in multiple places, not just that. Okay. Oh my God. Thank you very much. Good work. All right, we're moving right along. Um, development department. This is what you stuck on this board. <laughs> this um, first thing under the development department is the PZ 2022 1021 1758th Street retaining wall variance. Um, Council, have any questions? I uh, will have a question. Come on up. And it will be for the applicant. And then, Mr. Walker, can you put the conditions and what staff recommendations are? So that's so the condition if we did so 
obviously I think the applicant is asking for a variance, so I don't know how we would remove it and grant the approval, but because um, it's probably a lot of that wall is in the right of way. Did you yeah. did you have any idea of where that might be on that on that and, wall? And they can add a little clarity to that. The, uh, the intent is not to ask uh, them to remove it. Uh, the intent is to uh, make sure that if uh, any of these utilities come through, correct, at the time that it might be necessary to remove it, they may be required to remove that portion. And we would not be required to build the dock. We would not be required. If it happens that way. Right. So that's right. Do you understand what that means? Okay, so um, this would not mean that we would need to remove that amount in the right way right now? Correct. Okay. And then if and when somebody needed to come in there and replace it, who knows, it may not ever happen, but they happen to replace something that we don't have to replace your non conforming wall. Right, right, okay. Yeah. Basically. That, that's helpful. Okay. And that's helpful too. And then, um, so, okay. So that's, that's, that's all I wanted to know and make sure that the, we're not granting a variance on something that's not. Should have just taken it down in the first place. I didn't understand what he was, uh, and that's what kind of led to me. So, all right, um, yeah, that's really all I got. I mean, uh, I, I do want to ask you a question. Is it your intent to eventually stain that wall? Um, I don't know. We have wooden beams on our new home that are also the natural color, so it, it, it aligns. Yeah, you can see one of the beams on the front porch. Uh -huh. um, and, and they tie right now, but I know that over time the, the wall or the beams on the home will start to, to get washed out, so we probably would stain it. And at, what, would that require another turn? Okay. No. Yeah. If, if it starts looking bad, we would. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's really bright right now, but you can't, you can't really touch it for about six months. And, right. and then it becomes less bright. Right. However, it would be nice if it were it, if it had a finish on it. Right. So yes. in six months' time, it, it wouldn't require very much. And there's a retaining wall, of, uh, another similar kind of constructed retaining wall up at the neighbor's house there. It looks like that looks like it's pressure treated, same size, same dimension. Mm -hmm. It would be. And it comes, yeah. And we, so it's patina. We we had the discussion with Andrew about that because that's another issue. That's another issue and it has nothing to do with you and therefore we're not going there, if you don't mind. Um, because of you. Yeah. Uh, no, no. And there's and, and believe me, there we are not trying to be punitive in any way, shape, or form. Right. And we don't want to. And we understand your predicament. Um, I got nothing else to add. Um because that other one I don't think they ever stained it. Is that what, what ours would look like? Years on the road? A couple years on the road. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it's still bright. Yeah, and it's. Yeah. And if you want to, uh, if, you, if you try to stain over it when it goes gray, mm -hmm. it comes out a different color than if you stain it at six months when, okay. when the chemicals have dried out, the wood's dried out, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So you could choose your color. Same thing with your columns and all that. Yeah, you could choose yeah. your color. That's a lot of that. Yeah, and it's not a big deal. You can do it yourself. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. It's easy so, <laughs> and, and it also does prolong the life a little bit. That's in ground contact, so maybe not so much, but it certainly would um, prolong. And the only reason I'm making that question and, and ask is that it's really bright. Yes, yes. So it'd be nice if it blended into the landscape better. Okay. That's it for me. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, number two under development department is PZ 2022 1022 2135 American Industrial Way sign variances. I think I'm pretty clear, crystal clear on it. So I'm, I'm good. The, the only thing that I want to say is that. I understand that you want two of the numbers, address numbers, yes. on that side of the building. Well, no. If one would be the 2135 that's already painted, oh. the other one we're asking for would be a tenant name. So 
there will be less than but, a cumulative of them. But the proposed two wall signs on the east facade, 2135. Yes, I'm not following you. I'm so, the, so the two at, signs I'm looking at the two in red, signs. you got it, in red, one would be the 2135 that's up there right now. Okay. And then the other one in the uh, red box would be a tenant name. Oh. So it would just be one um, address indicator and a tenant name. Okay. Because okay. again, because the way the road curves, yeah. you would know it's 2135 when you're, if you were coming up from Peachtree, right. which is why we wanted that on that. And then there's the larger mural on the, um, side you know the long side right so no 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 there would be just there would just be on each side one two one three five okay and i understand that you um that there has been a suggestion made that you're the neighbors are building this two one three five well that's the ad, that's the address but I mean, you're kind of using that as the neighbors are building the two one three five building as yeah. opposed to the tables and chairs building? Yeah, I mean, we call it tables and chairs, and that's been kind of the talk, but you know, when we had to apply for permits and whatnot, it needed to be the street address, and um, so. The, I only want to say two things, and, and I understand that being a neighbor of the building, I sure. think that, you know, that's what we do. And I'd almost like to see that 2135 number painted up there to be a miniature version of the mural that you've got painted. Uh, if it would be readable, right? Well, it's up there now because it's, it's been painted. Kind of yeah, iconic. it's a yeah. Uh, the mural is kind of iconic. Yeah, and then yeah. that would also tie into that icon. So those numbers were original numbers; they just restored them. They were already on. Oh, they were. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, never mind. You know your trees are going to grow. Right? Pardon me. Your trees are going to grow in front of them. I know. Well. So, so what? So what if it? So the name of the building is what? Well, I mean, the name of the building is, is 2135. I mean, it's the street address. But we do have a tables and chairs sign that we want a tenant to use somewhere. It may be on, on the inside. Or we just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Just because we just don't know what, what a tenant's going to want to do. But Andy Holmes building. <laughs> that's right. I mean, we honestly, what we typically try to do. I gave you guys this building. It needs to be <laughs> the, but, So the longer sign that is yet to be, it's still going to be another 2135. No. no, no, no. Okay, so what is that one going to be? A tenant name. A tenant, okay. Yes. That's all yeah. I wanted to know. Yeah, it's a, it's a tenant name. Yep. Okay. And now we have to come for approval for that sign and whether or not they would want to mimic the cool mural, they'll, they'll, they'll know, but um, That's, they'll have their font and logo and, and whatnot. Yeah, so. it might be kind of illegal. All right, that, that's all I, I, okay. I just was curious about that. If, when, yeah, no, just each, there's only one, two, one, three, five yeah. on each side. When this was being explained to me, the way that it was pictured, it was very hard for me to comprehend. So I'm just now starting to absorb really what this all means. Cool. Um, I did. Anybody else? On the, on the monument side. Yeah. I, I know that the code requires it to be about 50 feet. That would put it in the parking lot or in the lobby if it was about 50 feet. But is there, it just seems like, still this seems like an odd location for it. Well, there's really not a great spot, honestly. And I mean, that area. But if you could put it anywhere you want, where would you put it? I mean, kind of there because you can okay. see it really from yeah, heading down just, and right. up. So okay. it's just sort of a weird curve, as it we is, know. Is hey, if you don't want it in another location, then neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's from that angle, I mean, we haven't really fully laid it out yet, but that is showing more of a you know, perpendicular to the building. So you wouldn't pick it up until you're a little bit further down, but- What if it were perpendicular to the curve instead? So you could see it coming in? Though. Angled me, yeah. yeah. I'm, I, don't see an, I don't see an I don't see issue with that at all. Like I said, we haven't, what you, what you saw in those images is basically all we've gotten to so yeah. far because we haven't submitted. So I'm, fine I'm good with that. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, believe me, we want it to be visible. We're spending money to build it. So we want it, we want it to be, uh, as will a tenant or tenants, have their name on there. So we're totally open to that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to see that project. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, we are too. We hopefully will see Evo in the next couple of weeks. Oh, thanks. Okay, the item number three under the development department, we have the resolution to amend the future development map, FLU map, in the comprehensive plan. Thank you. This is based on, and, and this is, pardon me, should council um, desire to move forward with, this is directly related to uh, the item uh, of 
your second read, which is uh, EZ 2022-993, Shanley Town Homes. Um, and so, you should have drive project. The DJ drive project. DJ drive project. So should council uh, decide to move forward, uh, allow that project to move forward, um, they would need to approve this resolution uh, based on the analysis and standards and criteria in the UDO staff does recommend denial of this. Uh, so if the council was to deny that project, it would, uh, the resolution would need to be denied. Therefore, they're related in that way. And that, so, would, be, and that would be from current or after the um, actually, the, the future land use maps would need to be considered before considering the gotcha. rezoning. Gotcha. So it would be but they're linked. But they are linked. We are not working on the first read. This is the, going to, if we This say, will be going to the second read. we go going to the second read. Um, so this resolution will stay in the development department uh, where it is on the agenda, so it'll be considered on Tuesday night, whereas the second read uh, of the rezoning and DCI will be at the second read portion of the agenda tomorrow night. Okay. Right. Or Tuesday night. But it is a change to the future land use, uh, changing that area uh, from mixed use to being density residential. All right. Is that it? Item number four. And this is uh, an amendment to chapter 18 of the. Uh, mm -hmm. Code of Ordinances Vacant Property Registry, which was act, uh, text amendment number four for the year. Um, and uh, with this request, this ordinance would amend uh, the property, uh, amend chapter 18 uh, to require owners or agents of the owner of vacant or, and foreclosed uh, prop, real property to register with the city and provide official information for contacting the party responsible for that structure. Uh, that vacant property. Uh, registration means filing a registration statement with the Department of Planning and Special Services. Uh, it, it, those forms would be filed with the planning department and the registry. It would be on record as to who the official contact for that uh, vacant property is. Um, uh, these would be new requirements added to the code uh, where the owner files a registration statement within 14 days of vacating the property. Um, any change of ownership uh, would also trigger a new registration of the property uh, with the new uh, information. Um, vacant real property shall comply with all the codes of the city um, and at the time of filing the owner shall pay a $100 fee to be registered um, for that property. Um, it remains valid for 12 months from the date of the filing uh, and uh, is required to be renewed uh, each successive 12 month period after. It addresses all foreclosed properties as well uh, and anyone who violates this uh, article would uh, be set to appear in municipal court. And the purpose of, of this is of course to have those contacts uh, readily available should we find uh, the need uh, to reach out to them. So would examples of that be uh, the gas station needs to get a car wash on Peachtree Boulevard and Shanley Dudley, the one by the Arby's, that's vacant. Mm -hmm. And then in front of the city of Needle, the Bistro site, Residential property as well. So, um, rental properties, tenant moves out, landlord middle cleaning and the property up, won't be living for 30 days. That would not be considered vacant if the landlord's actively working on the property. Okay. When does it become, I guess, that's, that's, the, that's the trick we're going to get, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, like if, if it's on the market, you're ready, but no one's living there, and it's just empty for three months. Or if it's 
If there's no activity there for more than 14 days, then it's okay. 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 activity is the trigger. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Activity by someone either living there or ownership. So for a piece of property that is the owner still claims that it's his property, but he doesn't live there, and he periodically once a year comes and does something and says, oh, I'm still here, but there's rats and stuff like that. Is that considered a vacant property, unoccupied? If, if we'll, we'll put it this way, if uh, code enforcement police arrive at the property and find no one, cannot get in touch with anyone, it's not easy to get in touch with anyone, and they're not able, uh, you know, the purpose of this is uh, for them to be able to find someone and address a, a, a question immediately. Right. Um, so an owner who uh, is not there um, and it is a vacant property uh, should, would do well to either register that property or have those conversations with uh, code enforcement and police prior to uh, any issue arising. Okay. I think it's a little open-ended. I think you're going to get some challenges, but, you know. Uh, Never mind. I'm just, um, I mean, definitely if, you know, I can see them going out and saying, this, your property appears to be vacant. You have 14 days to apply. Don't give them any ideas. Or something like that something like that because then you know if he obviously does if your guy doesn't show up for you he's not he's not gonna see that notice stuck on his door and he's not gonna say anything but if he walks to it like three days later he will see it so I I don't know. I just I just see I, I we, we've had other similar things. They'll have like a chance to go in front of his full judge and you know, give their case. So that is they they can argue that the judge make his determination and we move on. I think this is a great first step. We might learn some stuff along the way, but this is the first time that we've actually addressed this, and therefore, and I think that, that the thought process behind that is pretty well, is pretty comprehensive. So, like I said, I think this is a great first step, and we're, we're gonna, we've still got some left. We're gonna get through the fight of that. The registration's $100. We're gonna have all of his cousins. <laughs> the, the registration fee's $100, so it's not like it's yeah. kidding. No, it's Just don't not. Just don't name and try to name and be done, right? Yeah. And then, then it is something. Uh oh, that's a good one. Okay, we go with this one. Um, all right, now we are under item D. Carrie, you're dying to come up here. Renewal of the speed detection permit. Absolutely. <laughs> good evening, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, Council. Uh, the first item we have before you is the uh, renewal of speed detection uh, permit. Um, to authorize the mayor to sign another uh, request from uh, request from the Department of Public Safety to renew the public uh, the police department speed detection permit that expires on December twenty first, uh, twenty twenty two. Um, based on Chapter eighty six, um, Section fifty seven, the council um, uh, has a city ordinance that establishes the maximum speed limit is forty five. Black City to speed uh, speed out. Actually, sets the speed out the speed for the state roads, and they require a sign from the sign letter from the mayor, and to redo our speed detection in Black City. Thank you for the short version. Absolutely. <laughs> Second point. Oh, I'm sorry. Before you. you no, that was just in. You want to talk a little bit? No. Okay. Anybody have any comments or questions? Gary? Mr. Curtis? Uh, yeah. I, I'm just a bit confused of the documentation that we have in our packet here. This is the uh, pursuant to the city ordinance chapter, and we have all these uh, traffic laws that follow that for each street. Um, so is that necessary for uh, the renewal of speed detection permit? Yes, yeah, so well, it's outlined all the information. You see the information that each street, the streets that are in the packet has, has identified the streets that have to be approved. GDOT has to approve each street for us to author, authorizes us to run speed detection on those streets. So that's why it's listed in the packet. So it's a, it's a 
back in the old days when they used to have some small towns, you know, speed traps and all that, that was the kind of you guys kind of got involved in. Now it's kind of regulated where those devices can be operated. They can't just be wherever. And that's just a throwback to the old days. It, it, sins it, of our fathers. I just thought it was right. interesting. Apparently on my street, you can't park on it. According to this. So. That means that there's no parking signs present somewhere on the street. Is that what that refers yeah. to? I've got it. And you can request, by the way, to have this removed. I think they remove it themselves at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's that's you know that's a, that's sort of a neighborhood thing. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Sure. I just I was curious. Thank you for that. That's a good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, number two, I guess you're sticking around. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> The second one will be for the approval of the budget limit uh, resolution um, in 2020, 2022 budget is authorized and our state uh, state confiscated accounts and our federal state uh, confiscated account is twenty five thousand dollars. We asked for the uh, we asked for the approval to increase uh, of amend the budget to add forty thousand dollars to the state and forty thousand dollars to the federal. So. Am I to understand that the twenty-five thousand has been depleted and in each fund, and there's an additional forty thousand in each fund? Uh, uh, yes. So in our state, in our accounts, in the state and our accounts, in the uh, federal confiscated, there's an additional money, but it has to be authorized to move over into the line. And this doesn't have anything to do with code enforcement. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, okay. How about the golf course merger? Does that have anything to do with that? Uh, no. <laughs> We got some money from that. Oh, we, we knew that, but we confiscated it. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it gives me a resident of the state of North Carolina. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. All, all, okay. Questions, yeah. all questions and jokes have been exhausted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and number three, surveillance camera contract. All right, actually, surveillance contract. Uh, so there's been a need done uh, for surveillance cameras that's, uh, that we're putting in the Torreo trailers as well as our park. And as we begin to progress into the downtown area, um, staff has went out and, and staffed different companies to see the best um, technology that's out there. So we've identified a company and then request them uh, to sign a contract to purchase 12 solar power surveillance cameras. Those are, they, they look pretty um, unobtrusive. Yeah. Kind of family. So what? It's probably in the packet, but I didn't read John, it. John, John. What, 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 what are their capabilities? I mean, can they, are this, is it real-time monitored, or is it just recorded? Is it two-way conversation, Any, anything like that? I mean, I know they have the whole gamut. Yeah, yes. so, they, so they are able to, to first, I'd like to say they're both the, the solar power. Yes, they can, they're used to an app. We can utilize the app so we can um, actually go to real-time to view when we decide when we're able to expand in that area, one of the visions of the city manager is to in his vision to expand into a, uh, a real crime center. Uh, so it will be uh, able to transition into that as well. Uh, it's able to record, we're able to record information and go back and re recover information or evidence that, that is gained from it. So yes, it's, it's, it's versatile to where it will be multi, multi use. And how, how um, what's the like, I guess, Resolution or how they be able to be capable of reading license plates or actually be able to get a gift. I know people hide themselves and stuff, but if they do look at the camera, sometimes I've seen it where if you look direct at it, you still can't tell who they are. Right. Yeah, it's a high definition, it's high it's definition as well as gotcha. is able to to record uh, record and visually see at night. And how long is that that data the recorded data stored? Um, I have that information with me, but yes, it is because it's on this web based. We get stored for X amount of time so we can go back into the cloud and pull it back out. That's good. Okay. Probably some information, some of that information we should have out there so people know if they had an incident recorded three days ago or it's just gone in two or whatever. I'm sure it's probably at least seven days. Most of those kind of families are at least seven seven days. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and it depends on the size of the, 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 the size of the heart or the cloud you have and uh, basically the, yeah. the, the right. Yeah, the information around. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 
But if you needed to have that information available longer, then you can ask it to be. Yes, yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. we can yeah. ask and have them extend it, or we can right. pull it down and, and store it somewhere else. Okay. All right. Is that it? Parks and Recreation, nothing on the finance, public works, general service agreement for traffic signal maintenance. The city has been with uh, Sunbelt since 2018 for on-call services and maintenance for all the traffic signals within the city. Um, the following service they offer is a 25-hour on-call service, traffic signal maintenance for repairs, pedestrians, signal maintenance repairs, and the school zone. Um, public Works utilize Sunbelt to, pre to uh, preventive maintenance and routine upgrades for the city's traffic signal span wide cabinets. We do use the on-call service for emergency purposes. Um, Public Works staff is requesting a one-year extension for the agreement. It is a 15% increase for the hourly rates, material due to the rise of cost and labor of materials needed. That's it. Thank you. So, you're not gonna give out your phone number for you know, I'm not going to do the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the only question I have, uh, as being somebody who's out in the city, and I'm sure Jimmy can probably tell you a few, did some of the, some of the pedestrian crosswalk funding don't seem to work like they should. So I did request that, I guess, some belt or somebody perform like an audit to just go around and push all the buttons and make sure they work in both directions like they should. Um, I know that when you come from Peachtree Road to go over to like uh, discount tires, it mm -hmm. never gets you the crosswalk. It just, just, that's a little bit, that's a harder road to uh, <laughs> wing it, you know? Yep. Uh, so yeah, car, cars coming behind you and you know, uh, obviously four lane traffic going in and out of it. So. Uh, there's other ones around that I, they're not really worthy, but I, I would imagine there's probably multiple where the button just doesn't work. It's got dirt and be cleaned or whatever. Right. So I mean, somebody needs to go check them all. Right. I'll do that. That's it. Um, can we assume that either next year we're going to be asked to extend this again, or is the city going to be shopping for a new provider for funding going forward? Um, we're currently trying to come up with or something where we're trying to do a lot of in-house okay. um, maintenance so we can uh, take care of some of the stuff ourselves. Okay. So there's a couple of, you know, to kind of expand on that. Um, the cost of the materials has gone up quite a lot. So we're looking uh, instead of paying the kind of cost plus, the cost plus we're looking at actually buying that equipment and storing it on site. Now we have to do a big job of storing it. Um, and, and so we're preparing a place for that. Uh, but um, so that will help, uh, but, but again, we still need to labor in some of these situations, uh, especially with the, you know, the lights, with red lights themselves. So um, we are looking at what we can do versus what others can do, but uh, we will most likely be asking you to, uh, to going out with a bid of some kind. There aren't a lot of companies that do this, we've been with Sunbelt for a reason, they respond very quickly, um, and uh, we've been very satisfied with their service, but uh, we will probably be going out to RFP with this service. I don't notice the bid, uh, mm -hmm. is there an annual fee, or is it, was it just kind of, it's just an hourly, oh it's an hourly rate, yeah. so we call them a lot, we, 
we get a lot. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So the last thing, just to make sure, sure I understand it, but make sure everybody else, this is not for programming or anything. This is just no. changing no. light bulb kind of stuff. Switches, switches contacts, all whatever. That. Right. Okay. So if somebody has a complaint about the signal not, the timing being wrong, that's not a sun belt no. question. Anybody with um, any information from our boards, authorities, and committees? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, City Attorney, we're going to have a first read of the amendment for vacant property registry. We're going to have, oh, that's our only first read. Then um, we will have second read for massage spa establishment ordinance amendment, um, tax amendment, amendment to the UDO. The Chamber Townhomes and Mixed Use FLU map rezoning UPI. And that's it. Did I miss anything? Do we want to have a do we typically have a discussion about the first read and decide if we're gonna move it to first read or do we go on this particular one we've done not gonna do that? That is correct. Oh, we just talk we have talked about it together. Yeah. We have do we need some sort of acknowledgement that we're moving to first read or <coughs> would you like to move it? I didn't know, I just kind of told you. Okay. Yeah, that, that was, that was helpful. Are we in agreement to move it to first read? I, mean, I think we can just do a consensus. Just do a head nod. Head nod. Bobble head. Okay, so that will move to first read. And then the second reads are what they are. Okay. So we'll move it that. Under mayor and council, nobody wants to do anything, so that's cool. So now it's it's the fun part: citizen comments. Um, make your way to the stand if you got anything you want to say. And if the snowball doesn't come to the microphone, he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on up. Yeah, Remember, if you're talking to us, but we can't answer you. Come on up. What are you hear from? Me? Who are you? What are you doing here? Why? You, why, why do we want to know who you are? Okay, I wasn't expecting to be called out like this. Uh, my name's Paul Silvo, uh, Adley Drive resident, thank you. Um, well, I'm running for the city council seat this November to finish off the remaining term, but uh, I don't really have any questions very much. Do you want to answer them anyway? Yes. We don't get to ask questions. Do you have opposition? Oh, yeah. no. <laughs> Can't ask that the question. Yes. Oh, the question. That's why I was looking at the city staff if they were going to ask me. My mom got that. She said, "Say that." I, I, I did too. I said, "We can't talk back. We can't talk back to you." We're picking on you. Entirely a monologue. Totally picking on you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. <laughs> you have been baptized <laughs> by fire. <laughs> Um, I do believe that we had an executive session for. You do have an executive session for a uh, personal matter as well as pending litigation. What you said. So. Right. Anybody want to make a motion? Motion under executive session. Second. For purposes of pending personal matters and pending litigation. 